Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. 30 years ago, the Battle of Orgreave took place in South Yorkshire, in England's green and pleasant land. It was not a war, though it looked and felt like one. Instead, it represented the abandonment by the British state of social peace, the militarization of the police in a trades dispute, and the dereliction of journalistic duty by the broadcast media with which we have sadly become all too familiar. The police attacked the miners. The footage, however, was reversed to show the opposite. Heads and hearts were broken. Society was split down the middle. Something in Britain died that day. The miners were defeated and the slow descent of working class power to resist began. The result is all around us. The miners, including those bludgeoned at Orgreave, have never received justice. The now discredited leadership of the South Yorkshire Constabulary has never been held to account. But the campaign continues, and for the miners of Orgreave, that campaign is led by Barbara Jackson of the Orgreave Truth and Justice campaign. She joins us now. Thanks for doing so, Barbara. Just tell the viewers, because it was 30 years ago, what happened at Orgreave. Specifically, the 18th of June 1984 was when there was a mass picket of the Orgreave coking plant. 10,000 miners were there with 5,000 police. And the police were there in riot gear with dogs and horses. It was a lovely summer's day. The miners were in trainers, jeans and T-shirts. And at the end of that day, 95 miners had been arrested and charged with riot and unlawful assembly. Charges that at the time carried a life sentence. And many broken heads also. And many, many broken heads. In fact, some people didn't go to the hospital because they knew the police would follow them there and try to arrest them. And when Gareth Pierce, the solicitor at the time, came up to interview the men in the cells, she was horrified by what she found. She said that they needed doctors and nurses, not a solicitor. And the police's duty of care to people who were arrested had completely, in every way, broken down that day. Of course, it had been a slow burn. The police were increasingly militarized throughout the dispute. Uh, police forces were switched around mm -hmm. so that local police were not policing local mm -hmm. situations, mm -hmm. which was a new thing. The police were acting as a national force uh, for the first time. Mm -hmm. People were stopped in buses mm -hmm. uh, on their way mm -hmm. to picket in different uh, coal fields, turned back, mm -hmm. again, a new thing. But somehow, Orgreave felt like a bit of a turning point, at least to me. Did it to you? I don't know whether it felt like a turning point, but it's the part of the strike that most people remember. You don't have to go into great detail. Most people are familiar with the name of Orgreave. But we're quite clear as a campaign that there were many Orgreaves going on all around the coal fields during that strike. But Orgreave was the big set piece with mass numbers of pickets and mass numbers of police. And the resulting of uh, the media information that day showing the police, uh, the miners charging, not the police charging, set the tone for how that day at Orgreave was received by the general public. It was a case of who gets their version out first tends to be believed. They were on horses, of course. Yeah, yeah. It was really... A cavalry charge. It was a cavalry charge. And like one of the miners said at the time, if you've got a 40-ton horse charging towards you, you don't stop to ask what this is all about. And most of the injuries that the miners received were to the back of the head, the back and the shoulders, because they were just running away. They didn't know what was happening. And the 95 who were picked up and arrested were people who were just there, not doing anything of any consequence. They weren't officials in the NUM. They held, uh, in the main, no branch, um, you know, authority Office, at yeah. local level. They were just people who were easy targets, picked up, confused, and easy for the police to deal with. Do you recall what the media treatment of the Orgreave battle was like? 
It was quite shocking. One of the miners who were there was there that day. When he got home, his parents had already seen the footage and his mother said to him, lad, what on earth have you been doing out there? Even she, from a mining family and a mining background, accepted the BBC's footage that day that showed the miners charging and not the police. And that set the tone for the rest of the media to follow uh, as the accepted truth of that day. And it was years and years later that the BBC finally apologised or gave some sort of apology and put it down to a technical issue that they were using <laughs> some new film and quite a low-level technician didn't really know what he was doing with that film. But the media... I can hear a band playing. Believe, <laughs> believe it if you like. A violin. But the media, as the dispute settled down into its longevity and intensity, the media gradually, gradually shifted to accepting the government's version of what was happening. And the media played a quite shocking and disgraceful role, especially in the return to work scenario, where they just accepted the cold board figures about the number of men who'd returned to work and entered into a description of it's a drip, it's a trickle, it's a torrent, it's a rush, and really, really played, you know, on that sort of imagery and virtually did the government's job. The leadership of the South Yorkshire Police uh, has since been comprehensively discredited, mm. not for this, but for other crimes and misdemeanors. Mm. Uh, how much of a role do you think they played in this? Or was this just the zeitgeist? The time had come to attack a huge body of the British working class. Well, the time had come to attack a major trade union. It was already there in the Ridley plan that was outlined. This was Nicholas Ridley, the Thatcherite uh, trade minister, yeah. industry minister. Yeah. Uh, back in the 70s, he laid a list of um, things out that a Tory government should try to achieve when they came to power, and taking on a major trade union was one of them. But what the country didn't allow for was that the police forces all over the country would come together almost as a national police force, run out of the National Reporting Centre in New Scotland Yard and guided through that year of the strike by different chief constables. And the police had got a reciprocal arrangement to exchange PSU units, police support units. If one police force needed help, units were uh, brought in and exchanged. And in general, uh, it doesn't appear that the South Yorkshire police would fare at all grieve. If you look at the police statements from the time, it was police from Bedfordshire and Merseyside and Manchester that were largely arresting people that day. The South Yorkshire police seemed to be completely out of the picture. And we feel that that was a decision uh, taken with foresight that the South Yorkshire police would have to police those communities in the future when the strike was over. So they were deliberately held back at Orgreave and didn't appear to take part in it. Last year, nearly 30 years on, Ed Miliband, the Labour leader, uh, called for an official inquiry. How is that received by your campaign and, moreover, the communities? It's been received uh, fairly positively, but with hesitations. I mean, I shared a public platform at Hatfield Main uh, Pit Club in Doncaster last May with Ed Miliband. And at that private meeting, he made a, a commitment to an investigation into the injustice of Orgreave. And he then reiterated that on uh, local TV. So it became a public commitment. But an investigation can mean anything that you want it to mean. We as a campaign want a full public inquiry, looking at the policing of the whole strike mm. and the political interference by the Tory government of the day. But that gives us a start, if we get a Labour government in May, to put pressure on that uh, commitment to an investigation to become a reality. 
and it means that we as campaign can play a part in that because who's going to lead an investigation, what are the terms of reference going to be, and we would want to pay a part in uh, yeah. stipulating that. Yeah. Last year, uh, for this show, we uh, vox popped people going in and out of the TUC headquarters in London in Great Russell Street. That was until a security man was sent out to tell us to go away, and an official of the <coughs> TUC said, and I quote, the minor strike has nothing to do with us. And of course, that's the problem, isn't it? Because the miners were defeated, because uh, a working class movement that ought to have known that they would be next mm. did not come to mm. their side when it counted. Mm. How do you feel about that now after all these years? Well, we still feel um, bitter that the TUC and other major unions weren't able to deliver industrial muscle to help us during that strike and i'm quite shocked to hear what you've just said about right. the mining we showed strike. it on screen yes it's yes. nothing to do with us because <laughs> the there has always been some people who wanted to disown the strike during the strike and afterwards they feel embarrassed by what took place in the strike and the outcome of the strike and there's always been this thing in unions about uh, do we go for collective action or do we keep quiet and just be a service union? So a lot of those conflicts played themselves out during well, the strike. Well, you must all uh, hang together or you surely will hang Die separately. together. Yeah. Barbara Jackson of the Orgreave Truth and Justice Campaign, the very best of luck Thank with you. the next stage yeah. of the battle. Thank you. Coming up after the break, another hero of the British mine workers, but this time speaking about all things Russian, associate editor of The Guardian, Seamus Mill. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Sputnik. Bombers in the channel, warships off the coast, Britain's front line being redrawn, in Latvia. If you believe the British media and some government ministers, it is only a matter of time before the Red Army, complete with snow on their boots, turn up on a high street near you. How hot is the new Cold War going to get? That is the question. Helping us answer it is The Guardian's associate editor, Seamus Milne. Seamus, thanks for joining us. NATO are not very happy with you for pointing out a, a contrary view to this dominant narrative which we now have in this country, which seems to be reaching almost hysterical levels, that the Russians are coming. I think in the last few weeks and months it has reached a fever pitch. I mean, we've got the level of media coverage now of this crisis in the Ukraine and Russia's role in it, and Russia's role in Europe, and Putin in particular, has become hysterical and uh, completely unrelated to reality. And I think it is quite dangerous. I think you, they're, they're whipping up a kind of war fever and preparing people for a level of intervention that, you know, British people, people in this part of the world in Western Europe are actually not committed to at all, nor in the United States. Uh, they're trying to lay the ground for a level of, uh, of action in relation to Russia and the Ukraine that I think is, A, unjustified, and B, not at all supported by public opinion. But these things have the, a momentum of their own. And, you know, in the last few weeks, we've seen decisions to send American and British troops in relatively small numbers, we're talking hundreds, but still troops, to Ukraine, which is, to not, the a front line. Which is not a member of NATO, uh, to a, a, a zone where there is conflict, uh, in which uh, there's a civil war going on, which Russia is supporting one side in that war, and the United States, Britain, France, and the other NATO powers are supporting the other side, a government that came to power in an illegal overthrow of an elected government. And th this is a dangerous situation which can spin out of control. Mm -hmm. So I think it's necessary for us in this part of the, the world to be actually much tougher with our own governments and our own military and our own media about the stories they're telling about this situation because it's something that can lead to disaster. Well, 100 years ago, it did. We got into the First World War because if we didn't do this now, we wouldn't be able to do it later. And one, uh, it was like a, a train, really. Uh, the the war occurred because of timetables, railway timetables. I spoke yesterday in Parliament to Colonel Bob Stewart, former 
British military commander, now a member of parliament, and I pointed out to him the rather obvious point, ought to be obvious to him more than anyone, that this confrontation with Russia is, well, a trifle dangerous, because if it gets hot, if the shooting starts, this is not uh, Yugoslavia you're talking about, neither is it Iraq. Russia is a nuclear-armed superpower in which the vast majority of the people in the state are behind the government in the stand that they're taking. Is it really dangerous? Can it turn hot? I don't think it's the intention of either the Western powers uh, nor the Russian government for that to happen. I don't think the West intends to fight in Ukraine, although it's clearly uh, drawn the line in the NATO states that it set up in the former Soviet Union, particularly the Baltic states. But as we're, as we're talking about, the, you know, these things have their own logic and they can lead to their own forms of escalation. If, for example, as there is incredibly strong pressure in the US from both main parties, Republicans and Democrats, to arm the Ukrainian government, uh, which has been resisted up to this point by France and uh, Germany in particular. If that takes place and they send heavy weapons to the Ukrainian forces, by the way, which include fascist militias fighting on the front line in eastern Ukraine with names like the Azov Battalion, where they have swastika-like symbols on their arms and belief in racial superiority and white supremacy. These are some of the forces that we're talking about arming and supporting that the West is supporting at the moment. If that happens and the Russians then increase the level of supplies uh, with heavier weapons to the rebel camp in eastern Ukraine, you know, the potential for that conflict spinning out of control is very serious. And in fact, you know, we've had British generals, you know, like the former British representative at NATO, who's been speaking out in the last week, saying just this, that the potential for what he called total war is there. And his argument is, you know, that the British government, NATO, must take this more seriously, that military spending must be increased. And a lot of people are using this conflict as a way to try and protect the army and the armed forces from cuts and to, uh, you know, spend more on, on, on weapons. Um, but, you know, if people like that themselves are saying it, I think we should take it seriously and wind down the conflict and raise the pressure in this country and other parts of the, the world to wind down this conflict, to de-escalate the conflict. We've got a, at the moment, we've, there's a ceasefire in eastern Ukraine, which is more or less holding, and that some of the heavy weapons have been pulled back from the front line as a result of this so-called Minsk agreement that was signed last uh, month. But the sending of troops uh, by Britain and America to Ukraine, to Kiev, actually explicitly breaks that agreement that was signed, the ceasefire agreement. But Article 10 in that um, ceasefire agreement, the Minsk agreement, stipulates withdrawal of all foreign forces mm. from Perfect, Ukraine. Yeah. Right. And that is being breached by our own government, by the United States government directly. Um, but, you know, at that agreement is likely to break down again because it doesn't deal with the underlying causes and we're likely to see a new escalation in the months to come. So we need to be promoting, I think, quite seriously and pressing for an alternative and an end to this ludicrous anti-Russian propaganda which is blinding to people to the reality of what's going on and making a genuine debate and dialogue about what's taking place impossible because anything that contradicts the NATO line and the Western line which overwhelmingly dominates the Western media is immediately dismissed as Kremlin propaganda, yeah. whatever the truth of it. Seamus, George just mentioned that the people of Russia support their leader uh, in, the, in the current state of affairs. Is that the case, though? Um, how is the sphere in Russia post the murder of the opposition leader? Support uh, can mean different things. I mean, Putin is a uh, authoritarian conservative in many ways, and lots of people in Russia as well, of course, in the rest of the world, uh, don't buy into that at all. But in terms of his defending Russia's uh, security and standing up against American domination and NATO expansionism throughout Europe and beyond, of course, he has the overwhelming support of the Russian people and, of course, the sympathy of people throughout the world who want to see a more balanced global order. Yeah. Um, now, actually, in terms of, what, of the stance that he's taken in relation to the Ukraine, you know, Putin is in, in many ways a sort of centrist figure, balancing the factions on different sides and the pressures on different sides. The majority of people in Russia, I think not just from opinion polls, but from all sorts of other evidence, in many cases would, would like um, a tougher position uh, and stronger support. And of course, the rebels themselves in eastern Ukraine, many of them believe that Russia is not offering nearly enough support. Um, but I think that just reflects the fact that Russia 
has been pushed back and back and back in the past 25 years, 20 years since the old end of the Cold War, that commitments that were made, and they were made, the records in the American archives show that, that NATO would not be expanded to the east were broken, and NATO was pushed right up against the Russian border into the former Soviet Union. And in the end, you know, Putin has drawn a line on that, and he drew it first in Georgia in 2008, and again in this conflict in the Ukraine where the West intervened to support the overthrow, the anti-constitutional overthrow of the elected government a year ago, um, which created this crisis and triggered the rebellion in the, in the east of the country. And that's something which clearly has the support of the majority of people in, in Russia and, of course, many people in the Ukraine. This joker uh, from uh, NATO, I debated him in the Hey on Why festival, the How the Light Gets In festival. And he had only days before been Britain's representative on the NATO military command. And he explicitly said that British people have to get used to the fact that their sons may have to die in Latvia because that is now our front line. The audience was quite startled, most of whom couldn't have placed Latvia anywhere on the map. Uh, and yet, in a way, Britain is sleepwalking into this position. Shouldn't we, shouldn't we start a no war with Russia campaign or stop the war coalition, really take on this subject? Otherwise, we might end up in the, the war to the, the, the mother of all wars. Yeah, I mean, it's a very dangerous situation. The, the, the Baltic states were incorporated into NATO. And now it's said by defenders of NATO and NATO itself that they have every right to join whichever alliance they wish to which, of course, at the technical level is true, but th that alliance doesn't have to accept them as members, and it has impact on other states in the, in the region, of course. Wouldn't have worked if the Republic of Ireland had joined the Warsaw Pact <laughs> when I it existed. I, I think you're right. And so what's really needed in Europe is an overarching security system that includes everybody, including Russia, that doesn't exclude actually the biggest country in Europe, but cre creates a genuine security system for everybody and winds down these conf confrontations rather than winding them up. We don't want to be in a confrontation with Russia over the Baltic states, and there's no need for that, whatever. It is NATO's existence uh, which is creating these conflicts and its, and its expansion to the east. So. I think we need to ring the bell on this and sound the alarm because it is running out of control and it can go somewhere which nobody wants on either side of this confrontation. Very briefly then, what's it all about? Russia is not a communist country. Putin is not a communist. Uh, <coughs> Russia is uh, a, a capitalist economy like uh, all others in, in Europe. What's the real reason behind this belligerence towards Russia, towards Putin? Well, I think it does go it does come down to this uh, drive by the United States and its allies to use the collapse of the Soviet Union to take control of the continent, to um, in ensure that American power is embedded into the European system indefinitely. And that was something that was specifically laid out by the United States government in the aftermath of the collapse of the Soviet Union. We've got the documents showing that. And it's also in the case of, of Ukraine. It's been a prize, as the Americans have said, for decades to effectively get control of Ukraine because Ukraine is economically, although it's a basket case at the moment, it has huge economic potential and always has had, and uh, allied with Russia, or, you know, part of a wider um, bloc, including Russia, gives Russia more strength than the United States and its allies want to see it have. In the end, this is about the attempt to maintain a unipolar world or an American and Western dominated order, which has broken down in the last few years. And that's what's created, I think, uh, some of this conflict. But from the point of view of most people in the world, they want to see a multipolar order. They don't want to see uh, a global system dominated by one power and its allies, which overwhelmingly dominates the world militarily. And that's something we're seeing played out in these conflicts. Seamus Milne, thank God for you. And now it's your turn to tell us what you think through the portals of social media. What's rattling, Gayatri? I asked, what's next for Russia's opposition? Love Truth says the U.S. will try to force many coups by paying communist and far-right nationalists. Well, don't laugh. <laughs> Might happen. On the miners, um, lots of response on that shows you that it really still, still is still a vivid years yeah, on, subject. Yeah. Yeah. David Taylor says... Why did they lose? Because not enough of the working class supported them. 
and divide it in four. Well, that sums it up. I couldn't put it better than that. Well, that's all that we've got time for this week. Which, alas, means that's the end of the show. Stay in touch with us on Twitter, RT underscore Sputnik, and on Facebook. You can like us on Sputnik on Russia Today. It's goodbye from me, Gayatri. And from me, George Galloway. It's been marvellous. <laughs>